the next speaker of the day is going to talk to us on investment process and portfolio construction. See, normally uh, in a TV news channel, we get to hear the news reader and uh, we never get to see the person uh, behind uh, the news, the people behind the news. Now, we are now going to talk uh, we are here from Mr. Balaji Vaidyanath, who is the fund manager for uh, Sundaram Mutual Fund uh, Portfolio Management Services. His experience, he started off with Kotak Securities as an analyst in market research and analyst over 60 companies in pharma, financial services, consumer media industries is what he has uh, analyzed. At Sundram uh, PMS, he actively manages and advises more than $200 million of client money, which is all based on the client mandates. He generates product ideas to differentiate PMS uh, from mutual funds to increase uh, the returns from the AUM. And he is actively involved in uh, presentations and uh, uh, roadshows. Invite Mr. Balaji Vaidyanath to take the floor. <laughs> Mr. Balaji Vaidyanath will speak for 55 minutes. We'll uh, keep 45 minutes for the talk and 10 minutes for the Q&A. Is that okay, Balaji? I don't know what to talk for 55 minutes again. <laughs> <laughs> so you can talk whenever you wish and then we can have a QA. Sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the time and uh, thanks uh, from Money Care for the invite. I'm really honored to be present here and to share a few views on. Uh, what we are trying to do in terms of portfolio management and uh, also on the mutual fund side, uh, generally how things happen. I don't have a formal presentation to make, it's more uh, extempo. Uh, frankly, uh, you know, uh, another gentleman was supposed to talk and you know, unfortunately he couldn't join, so I'm just uh, uh, backing him up here. Uh, so by and large, uh, Portfolio construction. Uh, you see these mutual fund fact sheets. Uh, each and every fact sheet contains a lot of data, a lot of information. Few few portfolios have you know 100 plus stocks. Few portfolios have just 20 stocks. And then you have the standard deviation and beta and Sharpe ratio and beta ratio. And, you know every fact sheet the graph always goes like this. No fact sheet will show the graph goes like this. And past performance will always be like this, you know, a compounded return of so much, speed and inflation, this, that. Uh, fact of the matter is, uh, you know, there are times, there are tough times in terms of portfolio construction also. Uh, uh, the, the fact that fund managers, uh, you know, there's general perception that fund managers have two horns and they know everything. Uh, to be very frank, absolutely not correct. So they are very much fallible like every other uh, PVC <coughs> investment. We also come across and make a lot of uh, mistakes, though unintentional, but the endeavor is always to give in more than 100% efforts to try and give the best possible returns to the investors. Something which can beat other asset classes like gold, equities, real estate, and most importantly, of course, you know, inflation. Uh, so when it comes to portfolio construction, is there a mark? Yeah. Right. These are the broad uh, facets of portfolio construction. Uh, I just uh, take you through it and you are free to interrupt whenever you want. Uh, so uh, as per the textbook definition, there are about you know three to four ways which a portfolio is constructed. I am sticking myself to equities over here. I am not a bond expert. I don't know anything about fixed income. <coughs> I just know the basics. And I am talking only about from an equity point of view. So there are four methods. One is uh, top down. 
the second method is bottom up the third method is benchmark plus the fourth method is constraint based So these are the four general ways in which uh, a particular portfolio is uh, constructed on the equity side, top down, bottom up, benchmark plus plus and constraint based. Just to quickly take you over all these four facets, uh, in terms of top down what we, uh, what fund managers generally try to do is to follow what is called as a EIC approach which you would have studied in uh, you know various uh, finance journals which is uh, boiling down from the economy and then the industry and then the company. So. Uh, if you uh, this this method is predominantly followed by FIIs, you know FIIs basically have no love for any particular stock or uh, you know industry or whatever it is by and large. So they have you know maybe few billion dollars to invest. So for them, what is important is country, right? So they come from that angle. So they'll give five billion to Taiwan, they'll give five billion to Korea, they'll give two billion to India and four billion to China. So all it matters to them is country, and all it matters to them is you know the macro variables which is basically our interest rates and inflation and political environment stability you know corruption or the lack of it or ease of doing business all these things all these facets will come into the top down uh, so once they zero in on the country and the economy say for example india and then they go to the next step which is basically within india okay i'm going to allocate 4 billion dollars then what do i do next so they go and choose the industries pertaining to it, the ones which are supposed to do well, whether it is oil and gas or pharma or, you know, industrial engineering or whatever it is. And then later on, you know, they actually boil down to the company specific attributes and invest in certain companies. And what happens by and large is that when it comes to the last uh, method, when I say EIC, here, uh, you know, the, there is a basket approach that is followed. You know, if uh, people actually like banks and PSU banks, you know, uh, they won't really kind of uh, break, break their heads and try to say, okay, is Andhra Bank better than Syndicate or is, uh, you know, uh, IOB better than Yuko. So there is a basket approach which they follow where they take close to four or five banks and invest in them. So that is uh, basically what is EIC. You now, if it works, they continue and if it doesn't work, you know, they just once there is some uh, some amount of risk off scenario or if emerging markets are struggling, they just kind of pull out the entire thing and move back. So this is bottom up, and this is not only uh, sorry this is top down, and this is not only restricted to the FIIs. Uh, predominantly, if you are talking of large cap funds, funds which are in excess of one billion dollars or six thousand, seven thousand, eight thousand crores on the large cap category. By and large, I mean, I'm not saying that 100% people follow this methodology, but by and large, you know, you need to keep a close eye on the macro variables. You need to take a call on the interest rates. You need to take a call on inflation and so many other moving parts and then zero in on this. So the FIIs follow this and you also have the big large cap fund houses, the, uh, the ones with very high AAM follow this particular approach towards portfolio construction. Moving on to the second uh, is basically, you know, a bottom-up style of investing. So, which is completely the opposite of what I mentioned earlier, which is top-down. So, it comes from behind, you know, company, industry and economy. So, the point is, the fund manager says, you know what, listen, I don't care about interest rates. I don't care about inflation. I don't care about, uh, you know, all these macro variables, which the CNBC anchors keep talking about 24 by 7. And, you know, this TV screen is full of these people. So, the idea is like, to focus on one single company or you know 15 to 20 such companies and invest in those companies right so it's like you're planting 15 saplings so the fund manager is saying i am planting 15 saplings in my portfolio two to three saplings get destroyed by the wind or air or whatever it is about 10 saplings uh, you know grow towards normal sized trees and then there are about four saplings which grow towards uh, becoming huge trees that uh, start giving you the fruits. So that overall, when you look at it from a return perspective, you know, you make those substantial returns over there. So here the idea is like, suppose I'm looking at a particular stock or a particular idea, say for example, I'm looking at a company, you know, Relaxo Footwear. Relaxo Footwear is a, a company that makes uh, 
all all kinds of uh, footwear shoes and you know uh, sandals and uh, slippers and things like that so this company uh, so so what what are we talking of so we are talking uh, of a scenario from say 2009 everyone here will uh, will agree with me when i say that 2009 to 2013 was probably the toughest year for equities or for that matter generally as a corporate there was a slow down you know uh, world over you know uh, big uh, institutions like lehman brothers went bust aig went bust and uh, europe had its own issues countries were going bust china had its own slow down issues regimes were you know getting thrown out in middle east and north africa left right and center india had its own set of you know corruption from a to z starting from others to you know what uh, all those things so uh, obviously you know when you uh, if you had adopted a top down kind of an approach the india would have been a no no logically speaking because at every possible level there is a hindrance over here. so here when you follow a bottom up approach and look at uh, a stock from a horse with a blinders point of view so here is a company called relaxo footwear okay in 2009 relaxo footwear sold 50 million pairs of footwear 2014 march they have finished with 100 million pairs of footwear and 2019 possibly they will do 200 million pairs of footwear so this 100 million pairs they have sold at 2 dollars per pair you know average realization per pair is 2 dollars 5 years down the line 200 million pairs the average realization may be 4 dollars per pair so you do the math 100 into 2 dollars 5 years down the line it will be 200 into 4 dollars all he is doing is selling shoes and he is able to pay 15 crores to salman khan and katrina kaif and akshay kumar for you know brand spend and promotion everything written off in pnl and despite that he is growing his uh, profits and his 50 million pairs to 100 million pair growth has happened during all these problems that uh, i actually told you before so uh, if you follow that kind of an approach what happens is that uh, you ignore the macro and you say listen i am taking individual calls on stocks if the if the company does not have any debt on its balance sheet why do i need to worry about interest rates why do i need to worry about interest rates going from 8 to 10 to 12 let it go company's debt equity ratio is almost zero if the company uses uh, uh, you know uh, if the crude oil prices go up commodities generally go up so you you need to take into consideration whether this company will be affected this company is using rubber natural rubber prices have gone up uh, natural rubber plantations have gone up steadily over the last 4 5 years so obviously there is more rubber output since there is more rubber output the prices of, of rubber has structurally come down so this company is uh, benefited so you know all the uh, macro variables which you general which we generally stereotype and form an assessment has gone for a toss in this case so if, if you had uh, used a blanket top down approach and avoided uh, uh, relaxo you would have missed the re-rating of this stock from uh, whatever 300 crore market cap to wherever it is now 3000 crores or whatever it was a 10 bagger during uh, that that period so this is bottom up and uh, as as the style uh, you would have probably guessed that this would be more suited towards the mid and small cap kind of a uh, a kind of a portfolio construction methodology right so it, it's in the large cap space you know you need to worry more about uh, you know the uh, macro level and things like that on the mid cap side you know uh, although you have a benchmark the idea is to look at individual stocks their own strengths and weaknesses and then take a call so that is bottom up approach benchmark plus plus so benchmark plus plus is a is a very very convenient tool uh for fund managers to recover from underperformance basically i mean if a fund has been underperforming for a while uh again this this would work more towards on the large cap side uh what happens is that the idea is to hug close to the benchmark because end of the day we are we are questioned on the benchmark performance hey you know what nifty did 10% you have done only 7% oh nifty did 10% you have done 15% wow great right so everything is relative so in equities nothing is on an absolute basis for as per sebi regulation a fund needs to have a benchmark compulsorily for every scheme so in that particular objective so what happens is sometimes uh, when you are underperforming nifty 
So it's like a batsman who's going out of form, right? So uh, he may do all the hard work, he may uh, do net practice for three, four hours, but he just won't not be able to go past the 20, 30 run mark for some reason or the other. So it's like, you know, the form is temporary, class is permanent. So in those instances, you know, what is typically done is to move closer to the benchmark, right? And then the actual calls that you take are limited just to a, uh, maybe a 10, 20 percent kind of a weight. 80 percent, you know, goes and hugs the benchmark. So 80 percent of your portfolio performance can be explained by the benchmark performance. It's a balanced 20 percent, which is your own call. So as and when you hug the benchmark and your returns move closer to the benchmark and you also start regaining some confidence and you also, you know, know better in terms of what calls to take, then you slowly deviate back from the benchmark approach and you take your own calls and try to create that alpha. So this is more a stop gap temporary kind of a portfolio construction methodology which we are talking about. The last is obviously constraint based which is self explanatory. What, uh, uh, what here it's like uh, uh, the fund managers tie their own hands saying like you know uh, I will not invest in a sector beyond 5% more than the benchmark. So benchmark weight in auto industry is 10%. The maximum weight that the portfolio can have is 15%. 10 plus 5. I will not invest in, uh, if it is sectoral funds, obviously, you know, you can, you are restricted only to the sector. So these are, you know, this, this is a very, this is more for sector funds and this is more for, you know, such funds. You know, in, in case of, uh, earlier speaker was beautifully explaining about balanced funds. Uh, so in case of balanced funds, typically what happens is all mutual funds uh, tend to have balanced funds towards the large cap names. Right? So there is a debt component and then there is a large cap name component as well. So that, that approach is followed. So uh, there are about two, the, ma the main two uh, approaches are the top down and bottom up. So there is, there is nothing right or wrong in any of the approach. You know, we've had successful fund managers who have completely followed top down and they're still doing very well. And we've had successful fund managers who are, who swear by bottom up and they have also established a track record. And I can tell you schemes which have had multiple fund managers, each one following their own style and still delivering that return. Like for example, our flagship Sundaram Select Midcap, where we come from, it's a, it's, it's close to a 28 percent CAGR uh, since inception. Uh, and, uh, 10 rupees at inception is uh, 280 or 270 NAV today on the growth uh, side. Uh, so in this uh, 12 years, it's seen predominantly four fund managers. So earlier you had Mr. Anup who was a completely bottom up guy, you know, he would not even attend uh, conferences uh, by economists, right, so interest rates, inflation, he doesn't care. What will Bata do or what will this particular stock do? What are the earnings? What is the company saying? The ground level. What are the distributors talking about? And then, you know, after he departed, then other fund manager like who came in, he was more, you know, a top down based uh, approach uh, person. So he, he had interest in the macros and things like that. So at that time also the portfolio uh, style, you know, kind of uh, uh, which stood that change and, you know, we were able to generate those returns. Again, uh, you know, the presently it is again following a bottom up kind of a style. So the point is uh, there is no right way or wrong way of uh, portfolio construction. It, it all depends on the comfort of the fund manager. Some also follow a combination of uh, both uh, to actually work work out with. So uh, these are the broad facets in terms of uh, portfolio construction. And uh, if you would personally ask me as to what my uh, favorite would be, I would, I would uh, in my portfolio management schemes, uh, I would be doing 75% of this and 25% of this. Because in portfolio management, you by and large uh, uh, invariably deal with a lot of mid caps and small caps. So when you adopt that approach, you need to kind of uh, have a very, very good clue on what's happening. You know, economists and you know, all these London based guys or people, they can always talk about interest rates and fine. I mean, with due respect to them, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they have their views. But the point is like, you know, individual companies will display their own strength or weakness which you will know only uh, when you adopt a bottom up uh, kind of an approach towards uh, stock picking.
So what happens in sorry yeah yeah. I uh, thanks for your question. I am just reminded of what what saying which you would have also heard. Markets can remain irrational for a longer time than you and I can remain. So I completely agree with you. you know, there are stocks which are trading at bizarre valuations. People say price to earnings. Price to earnings is what market I mean, price divided by earnings. So if you look at it currently, the market price to earnings is 18 times. But if I look at a stock like 3M India. Trium India is trading at uh, Trium India has done a profit of 50 crores, but its market cap is 6,000 crores. It's 120 p. Jubilant Foodworks, you know, is hardly delivered any profit, and its valuation is so much. Why? Why? I mean, emerging market, fine. You know, you can say that these kind of uh, uh, things exist. Let us take the example of US, Amazon. Amazon market cap is 130 billion dollars. Since this investment, it's not made one rupee of profit. LND is trading at 14 times. Uh, if you look at it during peak uh, earlier bull market, LND used to trade at a 20 percent premium to market. And uh, India cannot recover from 5 and half percent to 7 and half percent GDP without LND performing. So there is some amount of sense you can make when you invest in something like an LND. And when you drive in highways, when you do things, you know, you there is uh, there is some L LND touches you at some point in life directly or indirectly. So the you know the, the, the traditional investing metrics work in such stocks, but when you move towards the newer businesses, new age businesses, these things really don't work. I mean, there are always new age businesses at all points in time. See, the new age business in 2007 was power. Yeah. So the new age business in 2014 is basically your quick service restaurants and e-commerce and things like that. In 2019, there will be some other new age business. So the question is, th these stocks are good from point A to point B. At which point are you there is what is important, right? So you don't know when it is going to, when the, uh, you know, it's like catching a tiger's tail, that's it. No, I mean, uh, it's a uh, HTFC group. It's a beautiful group, right? So. Uh, uh, the only bank uh, to have delivered a 30 percent earnings growth every year for, I don't know, 1998 till date and the la the highest net interest margin in the whole world, 4.1 percent net interest margin that HDFC bank makes today is the highest in the world and the fee income that they make today is one of the best. Right? So there is some amount of justification and it is probably the most expensive bank in the whole world today, HTFC bank, because of you know all these uh, reasons. Right? So, uh, but in the case of new age businesses, we don't know. I mean these are uh, in, uh, industries which are at its infancy. You don't know how it will mature or how it will take shape and later on only we will actually see uh, these things panning out. Yeah, so obviously there is a risk profiling that is done, 
uh, and I don't believe that when you are old you need to be conservative. I believe in the opposite. It's only when you are old you need to take all the risks involved. So the point over here is to obviously you know 9 out of 10 guys who I meet to or interact to say that you know the the major objective is people are very happy with a 20 percent plus compounded return over a 4-5 year period. Anything more than that you know is basically bonus. If it happens let it happen. So um, in terms of differentiation what we try to do is in portfolio management there is a there is a uh, 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 there is an availability you know where, wherein you can uh, get into stocks at its infancy you know you can buy the, for example i have bought, bought into stocks which are a 300 crore value you know just a 300 crore market cap you know, it should be it would be categorized as a you know micro cap or a tiny cap as far as the mutual fund space is concerned so i mean you can be the first holder first institutional holder in such names and wait for the re-rating to happen and then later on, when, you know, when it becomes slightly bigger, obviously it will attract more institutional participation and the re-rating actually happens. Which is what exp uh, explains something like a TTK prestige moving from 50 to 3000 or an astral poly moving from you know 100 to uh, 200 crore market cap to a 4200 crore uh, market cap. So the idea is to uh, follow a quasi private equity approach which is what we try to do on the portfolio management vehicle. Mm -hmm. where. Uh, speak to individual companies and businesses and if the prospects are good then uh, invest and grow along with them <coughs> rather than so there is no NAV rat race uh, as far as the portfolio management is uh, concerned right so although we do compare our performance vis-a-vis -vis mutual fund but you know we try to basically stay away from that consciously so it's more like correct so it's yeah so uh, see a 200 crore company even my uh, mid cap fund manager may like it. As a company, he may like it. Very sound financials, good management, clean management, good business prospects. But it may be too small to, for him to even take. So mid, select mid cap is a 2000 crore fund. Okay. So for him to take a meaningful exposure would be at least a 3% weight. 3% weight in 2000 crores is basically 60 crores. So if he has to take 60 crore weight in a 200 crore company, that would mean what he has to buy close to 30 percent of the company itself which which we can't do which is not possible whereas in a portfolio management kind of a vehicle where you know the stocks are held in individual name and things like that those things are possible and we can buy and hold and grow along sure So again, uh, uh, see, the, uh, the thing is, India is still a very, very uh, uh, immature equity market. Uh, you know, it is impossible to classify. Uh, so if you go to US, US you will have value strategy. In US you will have growth strategy, right? So value strategy is clearly defined as strategies where the companies are growing at is a very, very low single digits, but very high dividend payout. And you know, they are probably, so there is growth and then there is maturity and then there is decline. So most of these companies are in the stage where you know they they are at a decline stage but they have very very huge amount of cash on the books they do buybacks they give special dividends so that is value and then you have growth where you know these guys have absolutely no cash on the balance sheet but they are growing very fast and you know the business is uh, hotting up and they can really make a mark and create a good dent in the market with their products so that is you know, there is a binary thing you can classify a stock as value and you can classify a stock as growth this is as far as US is concerned. But in India, you can't do that. I can show a value stock which is exhibiting growth traits and I can show a growth stock which is exhibiting value traits. So I can show a company that is growing at 20%, which is in US parlance, it's a growth and its dividend payout ratio is 50%. In US parlance, it is value and uh, you know with no debt on the books, and no such thing. So the point over here is, uh, how comfortable am I with the company's growth? Uh, somebody, was, earlier speaker was talking about volatility, right? So he mentioned about standard deviation quite a bit. Volatility in earnings. How consistent and how less volatile are the earnings? 
that is the whole point so today i am buying a company that is generating 100 rupees of profits okay 100 rupees is the profit after tax for this company in 2014 and when i uh, leave 2015 16 and 17